Welcome, everybody. So I have a couple of friends, and two of them are competing against each other. One of them is Chris McKay, who works uh, across the street at NASA Ames. And he searches for life in the solar system. Yes, good. We have rovers on Mars. We have missions that are planned and going there. And we're going to try to find something to make it worthwhile say that we have discovered something in the solar system. My other friend is Seth Shostak. Uh, he searches for intelligent life, which we probably won't find in the solar system. But if we find intelligent life, that'll compare to Chris McKay as finding, uh, I don't know, finding New York and finding a steak in a refrigerator. I guess it would be the single most exciting discovery since the discovery of fire. So I want to introduce Seth Shostak. He works at the SETI Institute across 101 here. We're very good friends with the Institute. We're trying to cooperate with them. And he's been a radio astronomer. I mean, he has a degree in physics from uh, Cornell University and the PhD in astronomy for the from the California Institute of Technology. And he's been working with SETI for a long time, where he is, among other things, hosting a radio show, Are We Alone? He has co-written and authored books, one of which is The Confessions of an Alien Hunter, and it's just out of print, just out in print. And let's see, what else can we say about that? Oh, he was a guest at the Colbert Show just recently. So there are probably clips of him on YouTube. He's a very funny guy, and I'm really, really glad he's here today with us. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. And I always recommend that you don't uh, applaud before the talk, because you only regret that later. Listen, uh, this is a fairly intimate crowd. We could just all go out for lunch and talk about this, and you could grill me like a cheese sandwich and uh, you know, ask me all the questions you know I'm going to deliberately avoid dealing with here. But uh, I'm supposed to stay behind this lectern. Uh, how many of you heard of SETI talk before from Jill Tarter or me or anybody else? OK, so most of you know the, the idea here, right? We're, we're trying to find the aliens by eavesdropping on radio waves, maybe light waves, stuff like that. So I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm just going to throw out some ideas about how we might improve this experiment, uh, you know, thinking about it from the aliens' point of view. Because generally speaking, the aliens don't get a whole lot of representation here on Earth, except for the ones that occasionally haul you out of your bedroom at night. So, uh, and uh, Boris says you've got to be out of here by 5.30, so I thought I would just talk at you for a little bit, and then we'll open this up to uh, questions. All right. Improving SETI. Why we think they're out there, let me just back up here for a moment because some of you may doubt that they actually are out there. How many of you think that there are aliens out there to be found? All right. You know, this is preaching to the choir. How many of you think, no, probably not? All right. Yeah, I want to talk to you later. This, this is the reason we think they're out there, okay? This, this is just uh, one of the Hubble deep field photos, tiny little bit of the sky, really very small part of the sky. You see a couple of nearby uh, stars here. Is this a laser pointer? It's a pen. I'll just name this. Okay, uh, but, there, but virtually everything in this, this photo here is a galaxy, right? Our own galaxy has 300 billion stars in it, plus or minus maybe two. Anyhow, hundreds of billions of stars, and if you took photos like this all across the sky, you'd count about 100 billion galaxies, right? So you've already multiplied those two numbers together in your head. That's the number of stars we can see in the part of the universe we can see, right? 10 to the 22. That's uh, roughly the number of glasses of water in all the, beach, uh, all the oceans of the Earth. So that's, that's a big number. Of course, what really counts is how many planets are out there. And we don't really know that. I mean, those of you who uh, open up the papers, if you remember what a paper is, and uh, read about planetary discoveries, you know that we found maybe 350 planets around other stars. That, per se, is not a very interesting number. What's interesting is what fraction of stars have planets? And I asked uh, Jeff Marcy, he's a guy here in the Bay Area who's found uh, probably more planets than anybody else on, this, this, on, on the Earth. <laughs> and I said, Jeff, if you had perfect telescopes, what fraction of stars do you think would show planets? And he can judge that on the basis of the statistics of discovery so far. And his answer was, well, maybe half, maybe three quarters. Well, to an astronomer, of course, those numbers are the same as all, right? I mean, what's factor of two? Don't worry about factors of two. 
I mean, the IRS does, but we don't. So, in fact, what that's saying, and since, you know, as Karen uh, Anderson pointed out to me, planets are like kittens. You don't just get one. You know, you get maybe a five. Or we used to have nine. Now we have eight. But, you know, you get on the order of ten. That means the number of planets is like 10 to the 23, which is, you know, roughly the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of North America. So for the gentleman here in the second row who thinks this is the only grain of sand where anything is interesting is happening, this guy believes in miracles, and you should, you know, get to know him better because he's got, you know, that's a very audacious point of view. And it could be right, but it might be wrong. All right. Uh, there's another bit of uh, evidence here, indirect evidence, that suggests that maybe you aren't the only intelligent beings in the universe. This is a photo I made of the rock in uh, northwestern Australia, the Pilbara Hills, a couple years ago. This rock is pretty old. We know how old it is. It's three and a half billion years old. We know that age, actually, to 2%. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you can see these sort of cauliflower-like things in there. And those are what are known as stromatolites, or fossilized stromatolites. They're just big mounds of stuff built by bacteria three and a half billion years ago. Now, those of you who've been paying attention know that the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. And of course, for the first couple hundred million years, Earth wasn't such a wonderful place, and all these big rocks slamming into the planet all the time, ruining your whole day, keeping the place hot and molten and unattractive. But that stopped 3.8 billion years ago, and by 3.5 billion years ago, there were already traces of life. Life had gotten started. So the, the, the point here is that as soon as the Earth could support life, bam, there was life. Now, that's sort of like walking into a casino in Vegas, you know, putting in a quarter and hitting the jackpot. You know, a couple of conclusions you could draw. One is that must have been an easy bet. Or you were really lucky. And since you only have a sample of one, of course, you can't really say very much more than that. But this is at least suggestive that maybe this is an easy bet, that maybe life is something that's going to infect a lot of different worlds. However, there is this bottom line. We've not found any evidence for life beyond Earth, and that includes pond scum, to quote the former president, dead or alive, right? Uh, you may remember in 1996, they thought they had found dead pond scum in this Martian meteorite. Remember that big story, big, you know, big headlines in the New York Times. You can read those headlines from low-flying aircraft. It was really big. And a lot of my neighbors were saying, I, Seth, why should I be impressed by this? You know, they're talking about dead ponds come from Mars. I've got live pond scum in my bathtub, right? So, so what's the deal here? And the deal is, if you find that there was life on the next planet out, right, that tells you life's not a miracle, just, just an infection. It's all over the place, okay? But unfortunately, that turned out not to be very compelling. But in any case, now I'm going to talk about intelligent life. Boris already told you about Chris McKay's search for life here in the solar system. Uh, Chris is looking for stupid life. And... That's okay by me. There's undoubtedly a lot more stupid life than intelligent life. I know that. All I have to do is look at my neighbors here in Mountain View, and I know that's true. But when you talk about intelligent life, that would be interesting to find, because at least it might hold up its side of the conversation, right? Now, what do we mean by intelligence? I've said this before here at Google. Our definition of intelligence is very operational, straightforward. If you can build a radio transmitter, you're intelligent. Good enough, right? So ask the guy sitting next to you, hey, can you build a radio transmitter? And now you know how to treat him for the rest of your tenure here at Google. Now you can see this guy here. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's clearly 30,000 years after this photo was made. Uh, he's building a radio transmitter, so he's going to be intelligent. You can tell he's intelligent. He's adding some RAM to his computer there. Okay. <laughs> the crowd, which was not attracted to begin with, turned ugly. <laughs> okay. We, we don't know how, how uh, likely that is, by the way. Because uh, if I give you a million worlds with life, what fraction of them are ever going to cook up intelligence? And you might think, well, look, it happened here. And it did. But, you know, maybe that was really accidental. I mean, it could be. Uh, 65 million years ago, those of you who are reading the papers then may recall there was this big story about a rock that slammed into the Yucatan, wiped out the dinosaurs and three quarters of everything else. Right? And had that rock arrived 20 hours earlier, you wouldn't be suffering through this little presentation. There would be dinosaurs in Mountain View. Okay? So it's a little unclear whether you actually get intelligence, but there are a lot of people who are a lot of people, there are at least a handful of people, who are working on various theories about what made us smart. I'm not going to go into that, but let me just show something about, well, the increase in cephalization. This is sort of interesting, because it shows that uh, they say every time you show a plot, you lose 10% of the audience. Right? I got 12, so all right. This, this plot here, 
uh, just uh, shows you, this is data, these are data due to Lori Marino, who's a biologist at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. But anyhow, what she's plotted here is some measure of the intelligence of, in this case, dolphins and toothed whales, dolphins being everybody's favorite intelligent animal other than our simian relatives. Okay, and so on this side, stupid, that side smart. Okay, and then this is 50 million years ago and that's today. So you can see 50 million years ago, dolphins were pretty dumb, right? You can look at their SAT scores and, and convince yourself. But you notice they developed echolocation at some point here about 35 million years ago, and then a lot of them got smarter. And some of them got smarter still till today, you know, they're fairly smart. Two million years ago, the smartest critters on the planet were, were dolphins. Right? <laughs> I don't know what your hiring policy is with regard to dolphins, but they, they were pretty smart. At least two million years ago, they beat us, or at least our ancestors. But the point here is that you know, some dolphins have gotten quite a bit smarter. And the fact that the dolphins have, but also you know, octopuses, some birds, and obviously simians, this suggests that intelligence is not really just a niche market deal, that there's actually a market for intelligence in various niches, and it might arise on many worlds. Here's another theory that I kind of like, signaling for fitness. This is due to uh, Jeff Miller at the University of New Mexico. He's got books out on this. He's got a new book called Spent, but I'm not sure what that has to do with this, but it has something to do with it. He says the reason we got smart was because of the dating behavior of our ancestors. Right? He says, look, for a lot of, if you will, complex critters, the whole mating ritual consists of the males display and the females decide. Now, it's mostly guys in the audience, and you know this is true, but in, in the canonical example here are, uh, are, are, are peacocks, right? The peahens are sitting around looking at these peacocks and showing their blue feathers, right? And they say, well, that guy's blue feathers are pretty good, but this guy's blue feathers are better. And they take him home to mom. Now, what's in it for the peahen with her little <laughs> pea brain to pick the guy with the blue feathers? I mean, they only attract predators. Right? They're dangerous to have all those blue feathers. But the thing is, if he made it this far, he's still walking around, he's clever enough to avoid the predators. Good genes. And in fact, the very fact that he grew those blue feathers in the first place must mean that you know, he's got good genes because it's not easy metabolically to grow those things. Well, in the case of primates, we don't have blue feathers, but our brain is very tightly connected to our genome. If your brain's wired up correctly, and probably for some of you it is, then that means you don't have too many mutations in the genome. Okay, so for the, be the best strategy for males here is when you go to parties, you know, you just take off your skull, pass your brain around to all the women, hey, check it out. And, <laughs> and if they see it's wired up correctly, then, you know, they might be interested because, not because they're interested in having you be smart. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> it's, only because, it's only because you don't have too many mutations in the genome. The kids may be healthy, right? That's what it's all about. So, you know, you get guys like this who, you know, very popular because, <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, a few mutations. Um, so, so the, you know, the, the, the men's IQs are all being ratcheted up. Of course, Miller always immediately gets asked, so why do the women get smart? And he said, well, the females are under, are under a lot of selective pressure to be charismatic and interesting, because otherwise the guys wander off, you know, uh, and, and don't pay the bill or something. I mean, you know, they take the resources somewhere else. Okay, well, you know, this is slightly controversial. There are people who agree and other people who don't agree, but... My point here is that this is a very simple mechanism that you would get in any sort of uh, uh, Darwinian system. And consequently, maybe intelligence is fairly commonplace. Okay, how could we find it? Well, we could just look for big things. This doesn't, you know, Larry Niven, ring worlds. I mean, you could do this. And we don't do very much of it. Dyson spheres, whatever. I mean, remember, the universe is three times as old as the Earth. Most of the stars out there are older than the sun. There's been plenty of time. When I say plenty of time, I mean billions of years for other societies to get way ahead of us. Now, you worry about the competition. These guys are billions of years ahead, all right? And so maybe they've done something that's so big and so obvious that we could just see it, right? We don't look for this stuff very much, but we could. If you can think of an experiment, you know, you might want to do this in the privacy of your own home. Okay, um, another way we might get in touch is just to look for signals, and that's what SETI's all about. But, you know, it's mostly radio, but we also do optical SETI, which is to say, look for flashing lights. And that makes sense. Find them in situ. Uh, here's, here's a star like the sun, all right, G-type star. You know, when I say it's like the sun, I don't mean it has the same personality as the sun. I mean it has the same brightness and, and mass. And, and, you know, that's how many watts it puts out, like 10 to the 26. By the way, uh, the Earth, or should I say Homo sapiens, runs on about 10 to the 13 watts. 
that's a good number for your next cocktail party. You know that number. Uh, you know, that's all the automobiles, the trucks, the Wii's, the, you know, the iPhones, the power, you know, the lights, all that stuff. About 10 to the 13. So you see, we have plenty of headroom here. You got 10 to the 13 watts, or th 10, sorry, 10 to the 13 times as much power as available from the sun if we would just not let it go out into space where it doesn't do anything except show up on somebody else's star charts. Anyhow, okay, so 10 to the 26 watts is what the uh, sun puts out. That's uh, more or less that number of photons per second. And um, at 100 light years, if you're looking at the sun with a, with a telescope that has a mirror that's, you know, that big, you'll get 100 million photons per second. However, the interesting thing is this. If you take the world's biggest laser, which, after all, they're not very far away. They're over probably in Lawrence, Livermore, whatever. You know, they're using them for fusion experiments and all that or protect our nuclear weapons from other nuclear weapons or whatever. You take the biggest of those lasers, which produce really short flashes of light, like a nanosecond, right? You aim one of those babies into a mirror the size of this table over here, a one-meter mirror, and aim that 100 light years away. Just work the numbers. It's a one-line calculation. And it turns out that you will put... 100 to 1,000 photons into that mirror at 100 light years, whereas the light from the star is obviously less than one photon. I mean, let me just put this in words. Lasers we can build today, 50 years or so after the invention of the laser, are already powerful enough to outshine the sun if you have a one-meter mirror and you only care about outshining the sun for a nanosecond. We can do that already. So, you know, they could be sending pulses to us. They could be sending bits this way using a big laser. We can do it. If we can do it, they can do it. All right. So we should look for these flashing lights in the sky. And in fact, up at the Lick Observatory, which is, after all, only an hour and a half away from here, uh, we've had an experiment. We don't have it running now because we don't have the labor to open up the dome at night. At night, any of you that happen to live up on Mount Hamilton, come see me later. We'll get you to do this. But this little box that was built by this undergraduate, Shelley Wright at UC Santa Cruz, it just has a bunch of photomultipliers, which are very fast photon detectors, right? And just looking for flashing lights when you point this thing at some nearby stars. I think this is a very good experiment to do. Very little of it, little of it is being done. It's being done by UC Berkeley, or was. It was being done by us, or was. It is still being done by Harvard, but that's it. You could be in this biz. All right. Well, of course, mostly what we do is this, you know, Radio SETI. You've heard about this before. Have you, any, you, any of you seen this movie? Yeah, okay. There you see Jodie Foster in front of the very large array there in New Mexico, waiting for the aliens. Of course, the very large array has never been used for this kind of work, but still, it's photogenic. And then there's Matthew McConaughey, who doesn't actually do anything in the movie, but, you know, whenever you say that in mixed company, the women all say, doesn't matter. So there he is. Uh, but this was based on the work of our institute. I was actually one of the many, many consultants at the Institute for this film, and Warner Brothers would call up just about every day with a yet another question. The one I remember is, so Seth, what does it look like when you fly through a wormhole? So, so, did that last week, let me tell you about it. Anyhow, more stories, but you know, later. All right, this is the historically preferred approach. By the way, the fact that it's historically preferred doesn't mean that it's better in terms of the physics. Right? There's too much history in SETI, is my opinion. It's 50 years old, and that's, that's part of the problem. And we invented radio before we invented lasers. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we continue to look into radio. But it makes sense to look into radio. We've always used other people's antennas, like this one down in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo telescope. It, it's appeared in several movies. You may have seen it there. If you haven't visited this thing, you know, book a flight to Puerto Rico this afternoon and go down and take a look at it before the National Science Foundation takes it apart and carts it away because they're threatening to do that. But it's a very big antenna. It's 1,000 feet across, hold 4 billion scoops of Baskin-Robbins. Not a good idea in the tropics. But we, we can only get it now and then, right? We couldn't use it all the time because it's being used for conventional astronomy research. All right, so that meant we were trying to do SETI the way you would have to do, say, cancer research but you always had to borrow somebody else's microscope, right? Obviously, that slows you down, and that's been a problem. Only occasionally listen. What we're looking for are these narrowband signals, the things you see there, because those are the kinds of signals transmitters make, but not nature. Quasars, pulsars, they make lots of radio noise, but it never looks like that, so that's what we look for. Okay, uh, here are just some numbers. Let me just get to the bottom line on these numbers. If you get nothing else out of this talk today, and that's entirely possible, but maybe you'll get this. Right? Here's just a straw man to give you some idea of the sensitivity of this. Suppose the aliens are 100 light years away, and they've got a transmitter uh, aimed at us, and they've got an antenna behind that transmitter that's the same size as something we already built in Puerto Rico 40 years ago. Then we can hear them 
if their transmitter and uh, power is 10 to the fourth, that's 10,000 watts, 10 kilowatts. Well, your local easy listening AM station has 10 kilowatts, right? So, so the bottom line here is that despite what you might think, given the enormous distances involved, it's possible to send bits of information from one star to the next using the kind of technology that we already have 100 years after Marconi. That's really the bottom line. It really makes sense to look for signals because it's easy. This is easy. This is easy. Okay. But we've only looked at 750 stars. You know, people say, but you, yeah, all right, it sounds like it makes sense, but you haven't found anything, have you? And the answer to that is, yeah, I haven't found anything. We haven't found anything. If we had, I wouldn't be here. I mean, you guys are nice, and Boris gave me a pretty good lunch there, but if we'd really found something, I'd be in Stockholm collecting a check and having dinner with a king, right? <laughs> hey, would that be better than, I don't know. Okay, and, and I think that the reason for that is because my mom says, you know, when are you going to get a real job, Seth? <laughs> Mom, I don't want a real job. But I think the reason we haven't found them so far is we've only looked at 750 stars. That's just a tiny sample. It's not surprising. In fact, if we had found something already, I would have, you know, I would have eaten my chapeau because that's such a small sample. It would be astounding if we tripped across ET. We need a much bigger sample. Okay. And this just gives you some idea of the phase space we've looked at. It's virtually empty. I mean, all the SETI experiments put together in the last 50 years have barely scratched the old proverbial surface. Okay. Now let me just talk a little bit about strategy because that's really the heart of this. What do we do? We, we normally point these antennas at nearby stars that, you know, sort of like the sun, figuring they may have planets sort of like the earth that might have inhabitants sort of like you, right? And that's, that was the original idea here and, you know, it sounds good. I mean, if you don't know anything more, might as well do that. It's conservative. And there's nothing wrong with being conservative, but maybe we shouldn't be so conservative. Uh, we can look at the entire sky. That's another alternative to this approach. This is what the UC Berkeley guys do. They look at the entire sky. But that's only because they can't control the telescope. And looking at the entire sky, you might think, well, that's, uh, maybe that's better. Don't make any assumptions. Just look at everything, right? And, and, and that, uh, that appeals to me. But the point is that if you look at everything, you don't look at any given direction very long. And consequently, the sensitivity is much lower. Okay, so, you know, this is looking for your, your car keys, not just under the street lamp, but everywhere. But, you know, then the search at any given point isn't very good. Um, you can do what we do. We look at uh, individual stars. This is what uh, Jill Tarter and Frank Drake have been proposing for years and years and years, and we continue to do that. Um, what kind of stars we look at? Stars like the sun already said that. We also are beginning to look at smaller stars. By the way, those of you who aren't astronomy majors here may not realize it. The sun, yeah, they say it's an average star. It's not so average. Uh, it did pretty well on the verbal, but it's, you know, one in 10 stars is kind of like the sun. Right. And so 10% of stars are more or less the same size and brightness as the sun. 90% of all stars are dimmer and smaller. Right? And then all the stars that are bigger and brighter, the ones you see with your naked eye, those are the remaining percentage, which I think is zero. But, you know, it's still only about 1%, so you're not missing much if you don't count the big guys. Right? So 90% of all stars are smaller than the sun. And you say, well, why don't you look at those? Is there some reason? And there used to be. And the reason was, well, you take a little dim bulb of a star, and the only way it's going to support life is if the planet's really close, right, so that, you know, it, it gets enough warmth that the whole planet doesn't just freeze out. Well, it was figured that that wasn't uh, such a good idea, because if the planet's that close, then it becomes what's called tidally locked, just the way the moon is. One side begins to always face the star. That happens very quickly. Okay. And if one side's always facing the star, then that side of the planet's going to be toasty, and the other side's going to be frozen, and all the atmosphere is going to freeze out on a pile of snow on the, on the cold side, and this is no place for ET. But that turned out to be very naive. Computer models show that actually what happens is you set up weather patterns that convey the, the heat from the hot side to the cold side, and actually a lot of the planet is A-OK. -okay, right? So that, that's a good thing. We can stop looking at you know, one star in 10. We can look at you know, nine stars in 10, or 10 stars in 10, really. I mean, and maybe this is good news, maybe it's bad news, it increases the number of targets, but anyhow, it's, it's a, d a development. We could also look at other things, uh, we could look at stars that are known to have planets, well, we'll do that, but, you know, I mean, we've found 350 of them, might as well look at them. Um, special targets, I kind of like uh, special targets, pulsars, you may say pulsars. Look, one thing ET will recognize is the fact that everybody with a radio telescope is going to be looking at pulsars because, you know, they're grad students who need to get a you know, low-paying job in academia somewhere, right? 
Okay, so they're all gonna be looking at pulsars, and why don't we set up a big transmitter around this pulsar, so anybody who's looking at it, they'll also pick up our signal that says, you know, join our book club, or whatever it is they wanna tell you, say to you, okay? We don't do this, but we probably should, okay? That's not a bad idea. The Galactic Center, all right, here's the Galactic Center, for those of you who haven't been there recently. The Galactic Center, which is, what, 25,000 light years away or something? <coughs> yeah, there it is, center of the galaxy. It's a terrible place. There's a giant black hole down there, and there's all this intense radiation and so forth. But it is special. Aren't you special? Well, it is special, because it's the one place in the galaxy everybody knows about. Right? I mean, when Captain Kirk or whatever beams somebody down to some godforsaken M-class planet, you know, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. How am I going to meet you down there? They always meet one another somehow. But if you just say it's either the North or the South Pole, everybody can find that, right? Well, in the galaxy, there's one unique spot. Right? There can never be more than one, but okay. And that's the center of the galaxy. So maybe some really advanced society has set up a big transmitter in the center of the galaxy. You know, here's your GPS for the galaxy. Here's the weather report for the galaxy. Here are the Google servers for the galaxy. Whatever. It's all in there, okay? We ought to look there. The problem is, the problem is it's hard to see from the northern hemisphere because it turns out that it's in this southern hemisphere sky. You know, among astronomers, it's said that uh, God put all the interesting astronomy in the southern hemisphere and put all the astronomers in the northern hemisphere. I guess he doesn't want us to know. All right, the Galactic Center, we ought to look at that. Uh, black holes. Black holes are great. If you're a really advanced society, you can get a lot of energy out of a black hole. You know, you might think living near a black hole would really suck, but you know, you get all this free energy. Um, Eclipsing binaries, this was a, an idea I had about 10 years ago. I wrote a little paper about it, which garnered absolutely no interest. But let me just say, about half of all stars are doubles. They have buddies, pals, right? And a, a small fraction, maybe one in, in, in 50 of them, are aligned in such a way that the stars actually occult one another. They get in front of one another. And this animation, Boris's computer runs at uh, 0.2 megahertz. But if you watch here, you can see the light curve from that uh, star system go down as one star gets in front of the other, right? It's just a little eclipse. You don't actually see that. You just see this, OK? But Imagine that there's some aliens hanging out on planets around one or those stars. They'll immediately colonize the other star system because it's only a short rocket ride away. If they're really advanced, then they'll have all sorts of telecommunications between the two systems. And when the stars line up, you're looking right down the data pipe of that society. Right? So this scheme tells you where to look and when. I thought it was a good idea. I'm alone in that, but OK. Um, <laughs> Solar anti center. Well, look, you know, we're also eclipsing the sun. So you can imagine that, you know, we're in front of the, where's the sun? The sun's over there. So somebody in the anti sun direction, that direction, will see a little dot moving across the sun. Well, they won't actually see the dot, but they'll notice that the, the brightness of the sun went down by 0.01% for a few hours when we went in front of it, our planet, right? So maybe they send a signal that gets here just when that happens, because that's a sort of clock. That's a clock that tells them and tells us both when to, you know, pay attention. So if they did that, the big advantage is they know exactly where to send the beam. And you know, for the price of an automobile headlight in terms of the energy cost, you could send bits of information to us. That's only 100 bits per second, but hey, it's 30 watts. You, it's a high school science fair project for the aliens, OK? We don't, we don't look in the anti-sun direction either. All right, but let's consider the strategy from their point of view. This is, this is it. Why are they broadcasting to us? Why should we expect them to be broadcasting to us? Because SETI does assume that. Right, if we find a signal, what do we do? Well, we, we continue to follow it across the sky. Do you still see it, Bob? Yeah, I see it now. All right, we come back the next day when the star rises above the horizon again. You still see it? Yeah. Okay, and after two or three days of this, you'll actually call up somebody at another observatory and say, you guys ought to pay attention to this, right? Will you help us out? Go look. We're expecting that ET will be targeting our world for days at least. Because if you only get the signal once, you're never going to claim that you found ET. That could be anything, right? You have to see it over and over and over and over again. If Newton had had the apple fall on his head just once, but it never happened again, right? No matter what he did with the apples, you know, he probably wouldn't publish anything. So the question is, from the alien's point of view, why would they be targeting you for all this time, for days at a time? And I think they, they probably wouldn't be. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're interested in the fact that we're, you know, wrecking the environment or threatening one another with nuclear weapons and all that. I mean, come on. That's what Hollywood thinks, but you know that isn't true. How would they know about any of that? Right? We've been broadcasting into space since the war, say, 60, 70 years, high power, high frequency transmissions. So that means the fraction of the galaxy 
that has been exposed to I Love Lucy or the nightly news or, you know, films about nuclear war or the environment or in inconvenient truth, all of that's in that pixel there. It's sub-pixel in size, right? If they're not within 70 light years, well, put it another way, if they're not within 35 light years, there has not been enough time for them to learn about us and send back a message saying, you know, we've got a lot of used cars for sale, okay? So the bottom line is, and I think you can say this with confidence at your next cocktail party, assuming that Googlers ever go to cocktail parties, you can say with confidence, the aliens don't know we're here. So when your next door neighbor says, you know, they've been hauling my sister out of the bedroom for these uh, experiments every other night, you can be justifiably suspicious because why are they here now? They don't know we exist. I think that's safe. I'll, I'll, I'll bet my next month's paycheck, which is not heck a lot, but I'll, I'll bet that on that, that the aliens do not know we're here. Okay, so they're not gonna be targeting us. Why should they target us? We're just another star in, in 300 billion stars. Why should they be spending all this money sending all these photons to Earth? They don't even know we're here. Now, what they do know is that the plants are here, right? They know about photosynthesis because there's all this oxygen in the atmosphere, right? You've probably noticed. You'd certainly notice if it weren't there. And, and that they can find with optical telescopes. And that signal has been going out into space for a couple of billion years. So they know there's life on Earth, right? But it might all just be photoplankton, right? It could all be stupid plants. They don't know that there's anybody here building big antennas, okay? But maybe there are a lot of worlds that have life. There's also methane in the atmosphere, right? Which, you know, is due to what's politely called bovine flatulence or porcine flatulence. So, you know, they, they would say pigs in space. Okay, so they, they can find all that. They know there's life here. They don't know that there's intelligent life, all right? So, um, Let's, let's summarize the argument so far. They don't know we're here, so they're not responding to I Love Lucy, right? <laughs> Be nice to think that, and, and that whole conceit in, in, uh, in, in, in Cosmo, no, Cosmos, uh, the, you know, contact, sorry, contact, the Carl Sagan novel, where they're responding to our early TV broadcasts in the 1930s. That requires that they be very nearby, and it's extraordinarily unlikely that we're so lucky that they're nearby. So that doesn't really make sense. They're not responding to us, so forget that. Uh, they are aware that we have life because of the oxygen in the atmosphere, so maybe they have a long list of planets that are known to have life. Now, if life is a miracle, if life really is very rare, then they won't have this list. But let's, let's proceed on the assumption that life is not such a miracle, that there's life all over the place, it's kind of an infection. They might have long, long lists, if they're even 100 years more advanced than we are, of planets that are known to have, for example, oxygen in the atmosphere or methane, so they know there's life. We're in that list. We're in that list, okay? They're not doing any of those things. They can't be fishing with a galaxy-wide broadcast and it takes too much energy. Uh, they're probably, we're never gonna hear their leakage radiation. We're not gonna pick up their equivalent of I Love Lucy because as you know, we're getting rid of all that. That's very energy inefficient. All those big, you know, red and white transmitter towers on the hills outside of town, they're all going away. You're gonna go away. You know, you're gonna get your TV, your internet, everything is gonna come in on a fiber optic or a direct broadcast satellite or a cable of some sort. You're not gonna be broadcasting. All that goes away. You're not gonna hear from them that way. All right, but suppose they do this. Suppose they, they have this long list of worlds known to have life. They don't know if it's intelligent life, right? There's only been intelligent life, by my definition here on this planet, for 50 or 100 years out of a history of life that goes back close to four billion years, that's a tiny fraction. But if they have a long enough list, then some of those guys in the list may have intelligent life. They've got a big array, it takes a really big array, by the way, like 10 to the 10th wavelengths. But then they could target sequentially this long list of planets known to have life, just trying to wake people up. They'll send just one bit of information that's telling us, hey, there's somebody over there. We saw a flash in the sky. Right? If you saw that flash in the sky and then you saw it again, three days, three weeks, three hours later, and then again and again, you would pay attention to that spot on the sky. You would expend whatever resources you could muster to study that spot on the sky. And maybe they have a low power omnidirectional antenna there that's spewing out the equivalent of their Google servers. By the way, I've written a, <laughs> I wrote a paper once on what we should send to the aliens. You know, we always send them pictures of nude couples, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> I said, that's kind of nutty. Why don't we just send the Google servers? I worked out how long it would take to send the Google servers using various techniques. Uh, I think it's great to send the Google servers because you're not going to be in conversation with these guys. They're too far away. You know, it's all one-way communication. But at least if you send the Google servers, there's so much redundant information 
that they'll figure a lot of it out, right? That's, that's what I would do. Somebody pointed out to me, they said, but there's a lot of pornography on the Google servers. I said, so what? <laughs> I don't think the aliens care, but all right. Okay, uh, and so, so indeed, that may be that there's an omnidirectional transmitter that's you know, forever cranking out, here's all our stuff, right? Here it is. But in order to locate that, to know where to look, to know where to put all the investment to pick up that signal, you have this one bit transmission that says, we're here. Okay, so could you build this big array? Well, this is just some plot of the size of our own telescopes, and you can see that within a century, we could build an array that could do this, right? You know, what's one century? That's not very much. Okay, um, so here's, here's a sort of a straw man uh, project for them, that maybe they have a, not just a few hundred thousands planets, say they have a billion star systems that are known to have life, and they give each of them a nanosecond ping, and so forth and so on. Well. You know, that's kind of the power of the laser they need to do that, right? Five gigawatts, eh, that's a lot. You know, it would impress the neighbors if you built this in your garage. But on the other hand, you know, probably within 100 years, it's not so hard to build a five gigawatt laser. So we could do it. And this suggests that ET might be using this two-tier transmitting strategy, namely pinging lots of worlds over and over and over again so they get to their attention, right, with just one bit of information. Look here, we're here, that's it. Because you get the position, right? And, and then the low power, uh, you know, Google server information in the message. So once again, the logic, we're not gonna pick up their leakage, right? That goes away on our planet. It's already gone away on their planet. We, we have to expect deliberate transmissions. Don't expect responses to us or, or uh, information about how we can improve the environment. They don't know about any of that. Or asking for, you know, <laughs> your Facebook page or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, we're not special, we're just in a list. We're in a list, that's what, the best I can hope for. And uh, in order to address that list, in order not to burn up too much energy by trying to broadcast everybody at once, you have to do it in serial order. And if you do it in serial order, and you've got a long list, then the pings will be very short and they'll be intermittent. But uh, you could do it, and we ought to adjust our SETI strategy to look for this, because we don't look for any of this. We don't look for short pings that might repeat you know, three days later. We just don't do it, and I think we ought to, okay? Because I don't think that they'll send us a signal that's always on. All right, let me just finish up with uh, an answer to this question. I don't know how many of you know who this guy is. This is Frank Drake, and he sort of invented this field back in 1960, did the first experiment. Frank, uh, Frank still comes in the obvious, 79 this year, I guess. Frank uh, is the world's nicest guy, and also a very clever guy, by the way. Uh, he's been a professor down at UC Santa Cruz and also Cornell. Boris told you I was from Cornell. In, in, in deference to anybody who actually went to Cornell, I did not go to Cornell. <laughs> went to Princeton, but what the heck. Okay. <laughs> we played him in football. All right. Here's Frank. And he gets asked all the time, so when are you guys going to find ET? I mean, you've been at this for a while. Right? You still haven't found anything. Frank comes in every day. He writes that equation on the board. We don't know what it means. But <laughs> I noticed that he always answers the question when we're going to find ET. Right? I asked some of my other colleagues, like Jill Tarter and Peter Backus. I mean, there are only four of us, really. And, and I, they answer the question, but I noticed that the, the answers they give correlate very well with the estimated number of years until they retire. Right? So all they're telling you is how many years it is until they retire. Yeah. Jill is a little different. She says, well, it could be my granddaughter that finds ET. You know, she figures this is all like building cathedrals in the Middle Ages. It's a long-term project. You've got to be in it for the long haul. All right, I'm here to tell you that's baloney. We're building this Allen Telescope Array. I think many of you have heard about it. It's up uh, in a place called Hat Creek, California. It's much, much faster than anything we've done before because it's dedicated to this kind of work, also to radio astronomy at UC Berkeley. It's called the Allen Telescope Array because Paul Allen, a name that you probably know, uh, gave the money to build the first 42 antennas here. The idea is to build 350 of them. Okay, uh, well, there's the death ray receiver, and this is a little animation, which maybe I can make it work. Can I make it work? No, I can't. Boris didn't copy over the video file, but in any case, the idea is eventually to have 350 antennas. We have 42 now. By the way, you can go up and see this thing and go around and kick the tires. There are no tires. You can kick the metal, okay? Uh, it's, from here, it's like five and a half hours. Depends on how fast your Maserati is, but I recommend you do this if you happen to be up in the, you know, in the Cascade areas near Mount Lassen. It's about 30 miles north of Mount Lassen. Go, go take a look at it. Uh, but in any case, the real point here is that's going to speed things up because it's something we can use 24-7. Okay, here's some of the electronics. Nobody cares about that. Here's actually one of the critical plots. Okay. What's plot here, these black dots, are some metric of how fast we're looking for ET. 
right? Just the speed of the search. Okay, so here's Frank's original experiment. Those dots show that it's getting faster. Well, that's, that's kind of encouraging. Those of you who are still conscious after, you know, 40 minutes of this may note that this is a semi-log plot, which is to say the speed's increasing exponentially. Now, of course, exponentially is a word that the newscasters love to use, but they don't know what it means. But this really is exponential. And you notice from the red line, it follows Moore's law. Okay? All right. And that's because so much of SETI is really just digital electronics. Not surprising. Okay? But it's doubling in speed every 18 months. That's what it's doing. And that, that's going to continue to be the case for at least a, a decade or two. So here's the bottom line. That solid line shows you how far out into the galaxy this array would be able to check out all the good star systems, assuming it gets built. And that's a money issue. But let's assume that it does. Carl Sagan figured there might be a million societies that are broadcasting signals that are going through your bodies as you sit here through this soporific talk. Okay, now if he's right, then we're going to find ET by 2015 if we can get this thing built. Isaac Asimov figured 670,000. Asimov was smarter than these other guys, so he can figure this out to two decimal places. I don't know how, but he did. All right. And on the right, 10 to the 4, 10,000, that's the estimate by Frank Drake. Now, I say estimate, that's a euphemism for guess. But, you know, I mean, I've asked Frank, I said, Frank, 10,000, where'd you get that number? And Frank will say, look, you know, driving in on Highway 17 this morning, I put my finger out the window and it seemed like a good number. Okay, so nobody knows, but this is the range of estimates that people who have motivated this whole line of research have made. 10,000 to a million, all right? That's a factor of 100, maybe not. And the point is that if any of these guesses is even approximately right, then success is not far away, right? What this means is that we'll find ET within two dozen years. And I'm willing to bet you all a cup of Starbucks that that'll happen. So here's the deal. Either within two dozen years, you pick up the Mercury News, well, you won't be able to pick up that Mercury News. You'll open your browser, and, if, <laughs> and either you'll, you'll see, you know, scientists find signal coming from ET, or you get a cup of coffee. So it's not so bad. Obviously, there are always caveats. Maybe we're barking up the wrong arboreal fixture here. I mean, it could be that, you know, maybe, maybe we got wrong physics, but, I mean, that's no incentive to just sit on your hands. Might as well do the experiment. What would the reaction be? There's always a bottle of champagne at the observatories. This was uh, down in Puerto Rico. They're really there. Although, I have to say, every time I go down there, there's another bottle of champagne. So <laughs> I think it says something about the engineers. I don't know. Uh, People assume that if we were to find a signal, of course, the feds, the government, would swoop down on the institute and shut it all down, right? I ask people why they think that, and they say, because the public couldn't handle the news, right? Look, one-third of Americans believe the aliens are here, right, <laughs> sailing the skies in their saucers and occasionally hauling you out of your bedroom for, for experiments that your mom wouldn't approve of, okay? So you, to think that if they, they, they heard that here's a signal coming from 750 light years away that they would say, that's it, Marge. I'm not going to work today. I'm just going to riot in the streets. I mean, I think that that's a reading of human psychology that's slightly, whoops, wrong. Okay. Now, th this is a picture, a real picture, made a dozen years ago at the SETI Institute when we were across the street from you guys on Landings Drive. Uh, this was 3.30 in the morning. And we had picked up a signal that for, for about 16 hours looked like the real deal. Now, it turned out it was a technical failure. We were getting confused by a satellite. Never mind all that. This was great because it actually was a torture test of the system. It showed what happens if you pick up the real deal, right? Okay, now I was, this is 3.30 in the morning. You notice nobody's gone home to get some sleep. Nobody goes to In-N-Out Burger. They're just sitting there watching these monitors. I was so nervous. I was so nervous I, I had to, you know, I was walking around, couldn't sit down, walking around taking pictures just to give myself something to do. Now, six af hours after this photo was made, I'm sort of half asleep at my desk. The phone rings. It's Bill Broad of the New York Times asking about this. Right? The New York Times already knew about it. Right? There's no policy of secrecy. It'll be out there. And I told him, well, you know, we're following the signal, but, you know, it might turn out to be interference. How about if I call you back in three hours? And three hours later, we knew that it was interference. So no story. But... You know, all that time I was waiting for the feds with the narrow ties to show up and shut us down. I was waiting for a phone call from the mayor of Mountain View, whom I knew personally, but no, nobody was interested, except the New York Times, of course. All right, so that's what's really going to happen. It's not going to be the men in black and all that stuff. Well, never mind that. And finally, what could we learn? Well, who knows? To begin with, I don't think the aliens are going to be anything like these little gray guys 
these little gray guys are a lot of fun, you know, they're, but they're just projections of what we think we're going to become, right? We're losing our hair. These guys have <laughs> lost it all. We're losing our ability to smell. We're losing our teeth. You know, they notice they have small noses, small mouths, except for the guy in the middle. Um, they're short. You know, they don't load trucks for a living. In fact, judging by those eyes, they probably sit in front of computer monitors all day like you. So, <laughs> but this isn't the way it's going to be. I mean, this is fun, but it's not going to be like that, right? Think of the chronology. You invent radio, right? And, and, and within 100 years after inventing radio, people are already talking about AI, artificial intelligence. Now you're all sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, these AI guys, they've been saying we're going to make thinking machines in 10 years, and they've been saying that for 30 years. But you shouldn't confuse lack of success with lack of progress, right? These guys are making progress. And probably within, well, maybe another 10 years, 20, 50, depends on whether you read Ray Kurzweil or Werner Vinge or any of these guys, you know, whether you believe any of that. I, it's, it seems reasonable that it's going to happen, say, within this century. Okay. So that's good enough, because you all know by 2020, your laptop will have the same compute power as a human brain, right? Same compute power as you. Hope you don't lose your job. People ask me, what are you going to do, Seth, when the computer's as smart as you are? <laughs> I'm just going to turn the keyboard around, you type, whatever. <laughs> okay. But the point is, the point, the point is, that's the time scale. You invent radio, so you go on the air. And then within a century or two, you invent your successor. And it's not soft, squishy, protoplasmic intelligence. You've moved on to something better than that. My wife would certainly agree with that. OK, so I think that if we find a signal coming from ET, you know, you can learn a lot because they're going to be way ahead of us. They can't be behind us because they're not building transmitters. Statistically, they're going to be way ahead. You know, 100 years, 1,000 years, a million years, a billion years. And maybe they tell you all sorts of nifty stuff. Here's all of physics. Here's all of astronomy. Here's a cure for death. Here's whatever. All this stuff. And that would affect your gusto grabbing free living lifestyle. On the other hand, maybe we don't understand any of it. It's like giving, you know, like a, the, the modem output from <laughs> your modem output at home. Give that to a Neanderthal. You know, they weren't all that stupid, but they're never going to figure it out. Okay. So maybe we'll never figure it out. I'm, I'm sure that they'll distribute all the bits we collect with the radio telescopes, put them all on the web, right? People will be downloading these bits, trying to figure them out the way they figured out the you know, the hieroglyphics, you know, probably they'll never figure them out, but, you know, after two centuries, people begin to worship these bits. I don't know what happens. <laughs> but, but even if you don't figure them out, even if you don't figure them out, I think that it was worth the candle because you will know something important, and that is that what has happened on this planet is not a miracle. And that, you know, while we like to think we're special, we're not only not the only kids on the block, but every other kid we find is more advanced than we are. Okay, why don't I stop there and we can open it up to questions in case you have any. Anybody still, still awake? <laughs> no questions? Sign of a bad talk. Yes, sir. What are the estimates on, what are the, estimates on the number of possible um, um, intelligent uh, uh, planets out there, life and intelligent planets in our galaxy, according to the Drake equation. Well, that's what I'm talking about. The, the number of planets in our galaxy that have sentient life, you know, thinking beings, and those were those numbers n. Okay. Those were for our galaxy alone. So the 10 you to the 4 and 10 to the 6, that's, that's for our galaxy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's our galaxy. And just multiply it by, you know, 100 billion, which is 10 to the 11th, and you'll get the number in the visible universe. And that's a lot of, you know, a lot of people to invite to a party. Are you thinking of looking into other galaxies as well? Should we look at other galaxies? Uh, I've done that, actually, and some other uh, people doing SETI have looked at other galaxies. The big advantage is, you know, you're looking at maybe 10 million stars in one go. The, the disadvantage is that even the nearest galaxies, right, are at least 10 times farther away than the other side of our own galaxy and, and more like 1,000 times farther than the farthest star systems we look at. Well, a factor of 1,000 in distance is a factor of a million in, in signal strength. So. You know, they've got to be, they have to have a real honking transmitter for you to be able to fig, pick them up. And it's a little unclear why they would do that, given that why do they want to send somebody in another galaxy all this info. But, you know, I never try and second guess what's on the aliens' minds, because that's alien sociology and, and our knowledge of alien sociology. That data set is rather sparse. So. Any other questions? Sure. I was just curious, do you get pushback from anybody who says, well, you know, Maybe you find them and they're actually not all that friendly. What if they're not friendly? Yeah, well, um, you could worry about that. <laughs> a lot of people do. But keep in mind, they're far away. Also, they don't know that you've picked up their signal, right? You, you, you're driving into work and you tune in Ron Owens, 
And just because you tune in Ron Owens, how often does he jump into the back seat of your car and start molesting you? Not often, right? I mean, and if he does, I want to hear about it. But, but he doesn't know you've tuned him in. We, they won't know we've tuned them in. Now, of course, it is true. I'm, I'm being a little disingenuous because, of course, you know, there will, everybody who can build a transmitter, which is all the intelligent people, will rush to their backyard, set up a satellite dish, and start broadcasting their personal philosophies to the aliens. I'm sure of it. And some people want us to deliberately broadcast just to get their attention. And if you want to worry about that, you could. But if you really are worried about that, then you better shut down NBC, ABC, CBS, the BBC, and all the radars at the airports because those signals are going into space. And the radars are actually pretty powerful. TV's harder to find, but could so, do it. So once, is this one on? once we do find them, what, what do we do then? What happens if we find them? Uh, that's a really good question. As I say, we have sort of ran a little experiment to see what happens in the first few hours. It'll be a big story, of course, but I think what you would do is you would get the attention of everybody who has a, a telescope, and they would all be studying this spot on the sky, for sure. And I think that SETI, which runs on, unfortunately, a very thin shoestring budget, would, you know, and you'd get real money to build a real instrument and go back and look for the modulation and the message. Yeah, I think that's what would happen. But who knows? Maybe the entire populace would go nuts. But then in terms of, like, uh, telling them that we're here. In terms of telling them that we're here. In terms of telling them, yeah. So, so one part of it is, like, I think what you're saying is, like, picking up the signal again. So, so I, I'm not sure if I understood you right when you said everybody pointing at the same direction. Oh, yeah, well, I think it would be human nature to start broadcasting to them. I think right. some people would want to do that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that the SETI Institute would, but we might. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your day, and you can come up and talk to me later. Thanks.